Today we are answering the question, what happens at the end of the world, the end of everything, the end of matter, the end of the universe, as we explore what a banned book known as the Tripartite Tractate reveals in relation to the end of the world and what it has to do with a secret ritual known as the Bridal Chamber. It's going to be really good as we explore this once banned Gnostic text and we're going to get right into it. But as always, before we do, please make sure that you like and subscribe. Remember, we're about getting information out here spreading information it's not just about mindless entertainment this is about raising consciousness and hitting like hitting subscribe it just takes a second but it helps out a lot it has the algorithm spread this around it reaches more people so please take just the quick second it takes to tap like tap subscribe i appreciate it also if you enjoy my work and you want to see my work grow help me reach more people help me create bigger and better content consider supporting over on patreon that's patreon.com slash morgue official and you'll get access to all of our members only videos there's a lot of members only videos there's a new one every single week and you can also get that by supporting on youtube at tier two or higher by hitting the join button right below this video also please be aware there are a lot of scammers out there there are people in the comments pretending to be me saying to join my whatsapp join my telegram always remember hey that's not me i don't have a telegram i don't have a whatsapp so don't listen to that also, there are people and groups out there who don't like what I am doing, who don't like what we are doing, and are spreading a lot of misinformation and disinformation about me and our group and what we do. So just use your head, use logic and reason, and don't fall for the bullshit. All right, here we go, my friends. We're taking a look at the end of the world with regard to this banned, once banned Gnostic text known as the Tripartite Tractate, a Valentinian Gnostic text, and what it has to do with the secret ritual of of the bridal chamber, one of the most controversial Gnostic rituals. And this interpretation of the end of the world is completely different to how fundamentalist Christianity interprets it today. So I grew up in a strict Christian household, and I really appreciate the chat, by the way, before starting today, reminding me about the damages that mainstream religion does by putting the end of the world in a very negative light. Because yeah, I grew up in a strict Christian household and I have relig religious trauma syndrome, also known as RTS. And this can cause, uh, you know, intense uh, difficulties relating to PTSD and CPTSD in people who leave a strict conditioning religious atmosphere, who step away from religion. This can be very difficult. And one of the things that that is uh, very traumatizing while one is being conditioned into, the, into these systems is the idea of the end of the world. And I remember being absolutely terrified of the rapture and, you know, the Armageddon and all the, you know, negative connotations associated with the end of the world. But we're going to see there's actually a completely different way to look at this. Because remember, mainstream Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity is about sin and salvation, and so their idea of the end of the world is tied up with judging those who are sinful and Jesus saving those who are faithful. But this Gnostic information is completely different. The Gnostic interpretation of Christ is not about sin and salvation, but rather about knowledge and ignorance. So it's about understanding and coming to knowledge of what one is and this knowledge of oneself and reality is what they interpret as salvation they don't interpret salvation as this redemption from sin but rather as a connection to one's own inner mind inner essence and inner self now I'm getting a little off track here, so let's get right into it. Uh, into this. We're taking a look at the Tripartite Tractate, and this is towards the end of this text. And we've explored, I have a whole playlist on the Tripartite Tractate, and you can go check it out there as we explore the majority of this text. If you haven't seen those, don't worry. You don't have to have seen those videos to understand what we're talking about today. But if you like what we're talking about, I highly recommend them. Go check them out. As always, you can read these. People are like, hey, where can you read this? Uh, we know where do you get this info you can read it completely for free on gnosis.org so that's g-n-o-s-i-s.org a great web website and they have all of the nag hammadi library on there where you can read these gnostic texts for those who don't know these were discovered buried near the tombs of egypt near uh in in 1945 so the tripartite tractate starts off by saying 
this this section is called the process of restoration so immediately i want you to realize that here there's a difference between this idea of the end of the world as being something negative where here it's looked at as a restoration right? instead of it being this negative connotation it's not starting off by going oh the end of the world it's not the it's not put in terms of the end of the world or the end times it's put in terms of the process of restoration, restoring something to what it once was. And it starts off by saying, the election shares body and essence with the Savior, since it is like a bridal chamber because of its unity and its agreement with him. For before every place, the Christ came for her sake. The calling, however, has the place of those who rejoice at the bridal chamber and who are glad and happy at union of the bridegroom and the bride. All right, so there's a lot to talk about here. So first of all, we have the concept of election. This is the election shares body and essence with the Savior. Well, what's that about? Well, the election refers to souls or beings who are basically enlightened, who have understood what they are, those who have achieved gnosis. The elected ones share a body and essence with the Savior, which means they have this deep spiritual connection, this deep connection. They're they're like Christ, so to speak, where they, they have understood the elect you'll under they're also sometimes referred to as the perfect ones and the perfect ones or the elect or all this are just individuals who have understood what they are they have attained gnosis so the election those who understand what they are share body and essence with the savior meaning that they are of the same kind as christ and see this is a really already a really big difference between fundamentalist christianity and gnosticism where in fundamentalist christianity there's this unbridgeable gap between you and Christ. You can have a relationship with Christ, but Christ is always infinitely superior to you. Whereas here, they're saying those that have achieved gnosis, those who have achieved enlightenment, shared the body in essence with the Savior. They're of the same kind. And it says here, then it goes on to say, since it's like a bridal chamber. So now understanding this, what's this idea of the bridal chamber? It says, since it's like a bridal chamber, because of its unity and agreement with him, for before every place, the Christ came for her sake. The calling, however, has the place of those who rejoice at the bridal chamber. Okay, so when we talk about uh, the bridal chamber, I did a whole video on this, actually. So if you want an in-depth explanation of what the ritual of the bridal chamber is, check out my video called The Most Controversial Gnostic Ritual, I think, something like that. But anyway, in short, uh, bridal chamber is very important because in Gnosticism, well, what is the bridal chamber? It's this idea of the bridal chamber where the groom and the bride go to get it on. And this has been a controversial ritual because some people think that it actually involved intercourse. We don't know if it actually did or not, because this was actually a ritual, and it's gonna. We're gonna go into more detail about this, and it's gonna mention it as we go on. This this was an actual ritual that was done and performed in Gnosticism, kind of like a baptism, but it was different in that this was, you know, different than obviously the fundamentalist Christianity's interpretation of a baptism. This was about a union. So a union with what? Because that's what the bridal chamber implies. It implies a union, a union with male and female or a union with opposites. So this bridal chamber uh, metaphor, symbol or ritual is about symbolizing spiritual unity and enlightenment and ultimately things that are, there, there's different interpretations, but you can understand it as the merging of the divine with the human or you can understand it as the connecting to one's higher self, or you can understand it as integrating one's inner opposite. In Jungian terms, it would be the anima or the animus. In Neogenian terms, it would be with the mirror self. So having this union in the bridal chamber 
a lot of people would interpret it as being connected to one's higher self, connecting to one's higher self, connecting to one's true self, connecting. Ultimately, it all boils down to whatever interpretation that you want to select and all the different specifics. Ultimately, it boils down to a union with the divine in some aspect, a unity, a spiritual unity that is achieved, an enlightenment that is achieved because of a union. So when it talks about here, it says the joy of the bridegroom, Christ, and the bride, the church. So the bride is considered, this is another interpretation where Christ is considered the bridegroom and the church is considered the bride. And by the church, that means we just talked about the elect, right? So the elect is the church. The elect is, the church just basically represents the collective of the spiritually enlightened or those who have understood what they are. That's what the church means. In Hegelian terms, the church would inter be interpreted in terms of like the Holy Spirit or absolute spirit coming to consciousness of itself or the collective consciousness of humanity. So there's a lot of metaphors. There's a lot of terminology going on here. But in essence, the church represents the collective of all enlightened individuals. The bridegroom represents Christ and the bride represents the church. And this idea of the bridegroom and the bride being united is this idea of a completion of this spiritual process. Because according to Gnosticism, so fundamentalist Christianity is that Jesus came to earth to die for your sins. Jesus came to earth to die for your sins uh, so that you can be made clean because apparently you're dirty. It's not a great religion. It teaches you that you're dirty, sinful, and flawed. And why are you dirty, sinful, and flawed? Well, because thousands of years ago, a couple of people decided to eat a piece of fruit. So because of that, that's known as original sin, the original sin, and every human being is born with original sin. So it doesn't matter if you were the perfect person. If you were born and you didn't commit a single sin your entire life, if you were perfect, you would still be considered sinful and you would go to hell if you didn't believe in Jesus because all humans are considered to be, to have been born in sin because of the original sin of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, which is another very insidious idea here, to make knowledge be that which contaminates all of humanity and what Jesus must save humanity from, essentially. Gnosticism is complete opposite. In Gnosticism, eating from the tree of knowledge is a powerful moment. Eating from the tree of knowledge is celebrated as the first step of liberation that human takes, humanity takes from ignorance. And so while Christianity condemns Eve and says, oh, well, this is why me women are lesser than men because Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. That's, that's what the Bible says. That's what the New Testament says. Gnosticism celebrates Eve. Gnosticism celebrates the act of eating from the tree of knowledge as the first step towards liberation and understanding of what one's true self is. This is why the serpent said you will become like God because you will realize that you are God. And in different Gnostic texts like the secret book of John, it's actually Jesus who has them eat from the tree of knowledge. So in Gnosticism, Jesus Christ doesn't come to save humanity from sin. Jesus Christ comes to bring humanity knowledge. So Jesus Christ is a teacher. Jesus Christ is one who is here to help wake humanity up. He's not here to save humanity from sin, especially not from the sin of knowledge. Rather, Christ is here to bring knowledge. Now, this is why Jesus Christ is very much associated with the archetype of Lucifer. Because remember, these are all symbols and stories and metaphors. And Lucifer is associated with knowledge. And here Christ is associated with the bringer of light, the bringer of knowledge. And remember, these are all stories and symbols and metaphors for very real processes that go on in the human mind, in the human psyche, archetypal patterns. So we have here, it says, um, let's see. Uh, The calling, however, has the place of those who rejoice at the bridal chamber. The place where the logos has not yet. Okay. I, uh, 
missed my place here. So we have the union of Christ with the church in terms of the bridal chamber. We're going to come back to this ritual of the bridal chamber. They're going to talk about it later towards the end, which is really important. We're going to be taking a look at that. But first here it says, the calling, however, has the place of those who rejoice at the bridal chamber and who are glad and happy at the union of the bridegroom and the bride. The place which the calling will have is the eon of the images where the logos has not yet joined with the pleroma. And since the man of the church was happy and glad at this, he was hoping for it. He separated spirit, soul, and body in the organization of the one who thinks that he is a unity through with him, within him is the man who is the totality and he is all of them. All right, we're going to, we're going to get, get, explain all this. I know the tripartite tractate is one of the more dense Gnostic texts. And so we're going to unpack all this. And by the way, what does this have to do with the end of the world. Well, because this is talking about the unification of the bride and the bridegroom or the savior with the church. So this is in essence discussing the, not only the, uh, it's discussing the understanding of humanity coming to realize what it is. And this will signify the end of the world as we'll see when humanity begins to realize what it does. Okay. So, um, uh, we have this idea of the calling and so the, the, the calling, where, 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 did it, where was it here? The place which the calling will have is the eon of the images where the logos has not yet joined with the pleroma. So what is, what does this mean? The eon of the images where the logos has not yet joined with the pleroma. Well, the logos is basically the structuring aspect of existence and it's personified as an eon so it's personified as a being who creates things and organizes things but the logos logos is comes from the greek word that means word so logos is associated with word or even reason so logos is a structure is 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 structured or associated with with like structure and organization so it says here with a logos has not yet joined with the pleroma it's talking about where the where that organizing structure has not yet returned to the the pleroma is the fullness the realm of perfection the realm of divine light all right so pleroma means fullness okay so they're talking here about uh, the eon of images which is kind of like a realm where the logos or the restructuring or organizing principle of existence hasn't fully united with the pleroma now, it comes from the Pleroma, but it hasn't fully united from the Pleroma. Basically, what we're talking about here, and to kind of, kind of put things in perspective to help understand this better, is that this whole section is called the Restoration. So it's about a return. Well, originally, there was nothing but the, the Father, the Church, and the Son. It said in the beginning was the Father, the Church, and the Son. But essentially just a simple divine mind. And from this divine mind of pure light, all the different aspects of reality began to be generated. And the realm of divine light is known as the Pleroma. So from the Pleroma came the Logos. And the Logos decided to create out of harmony, out of symmetry, in a way that didn't uh, reflect unity and this gave birth to the material world and then the material world was structured by the logos and the archons the Ar uh, the logos appointed the archons as being rulers of the material world archon means ruler to be able to organize it into specific uh, categories and systems now the archons are usually looked at as very evil beings and enslavers of humanity. However, in Valentinian Gnosticism, they're not so much evil as they are ignorant. And they have all of these uh, tendencies that one might consider to be negative, like a lust for power. They really want to lust for power. They really want to power, you know, have power. And so they fight with each other and try to gain power. And the Logos looked at this and said, hey, you know, this, their, their desire for power and hierarchy can be used to, to structure the world. So the Logos appointed them at various stations and various ranks to be able to construct the material world. And the highest Archon, the Archon of Archons, the Archon that rules all the other Archons, 
is associated with the God of the Bible. So according to Valentinian Gnosticism, the God of the Bible, or what would become the Bible, the God of those scriptures, the, the creator God, is not the true God. It's a archon. The true God is the divine mind, the pure divine mind. So anyway, all the all of these things emanated and then humanity developed. Humanity was, uh, you know, developing as well, eventually created. And now here we're talking about a return to that unity, a restoration, a dissolving of the material, a return to the realm of divine light. So this is why we're talking about this culmination of basically rejoining what was once separated. Because in the beginning, you had the Father, the Son, and the Church. And then all these different various emanations and all these various separations to where everything became very divided. But now you're having that union return where the church and the sun are being united again. The sun, Christ, is basically a uh, unity function. You can you can look at it look as an archetype of unity, an archetype of knowledge, which its purpose is to help humanity realize what it is, not save it from sin or anything like that, but uh, return to understanding of what it is. So at this particular part, we're talking about um, a transitory state and where the pleroma, right, the logos hasn't fully united with the divine yet or the pleroma, but it's sort of like in a stage of preparation before achieving the fullness of the pleroma, all right? So so it's this, this time where we're having the unity of the bride and the bridegroom or the Christ and the, and the church and where the pleroma hasn't fully been united with the logos, but it's in this sort of preparatory stage, this stage of preparation because of this process that is occurring. So it says, and though he has escaped, which the places will receive, he also has the members about which, he's, which we spoke earlier. When the redemption, let me get a drink of water here. It says, when the redemption was proclaimed, the perfect man received knowledge immediately. So as return to return in haste to his unitary state. So do you see these, these themes? Okay. When the redemption was proclaimed, the perfect man, and remember, this always refers to someone that has received gnosis. And so as to return, uh, received knowledge immediately, so as to return in haste to his unitary state, to the place from where he came, to return there joyfully, to the place from which he came, to the place from which he flowed forth. All right, so you can see this is all about a returning from something that emanated or became separate. So when we talk about in terms of the end here, you can see it's about returning to the source. So when we talk about uh, the, the, this, this passage here is really talking about the importance of knowledge, the importance of gnosis as the true salvation, not sin, but rather knowledge that will allow humanity to return to its unitary state. And this integration or return to the source, the pleroma. It says his members, however, needed a place for instruction, which is in the places which are adorned so that they might received, receive from them uh, resemblance to the images and archetypes like a mirror until all the members of the body of the church are in a single place and receive the restoration at one time when they have been manifested as the whole body, namely the restoration into the pleroma. So, well, did I miss a, 
section here. I thought there was a section that we read that I wanted to discuss that talked about the division into like body and spirit. Hmm. I guess maybe that maybe that comes later. I looked at this very briefly before we started. That perhaps comes later. But anyway, it says it has a preliminary concord with a mutual agreement, which is the concord which belongs to the father, father into the until the totalities receive a countenance in accord with him. So essentially here, we're talking about the fact that instruction needs to occur. It says his members, however, needed a place for instruction, which is in the places which are adorned so that they might receive uh, from them resemblance to the images and the archetypes. So this is basically talking about how the members of the church or the body of Christ or these souls uh, need a place of instruction. And, you know, that's pretty straightforward. They need instruction. They need guidance in understanding uh, these divine images and archetypes where they will begin to understand what they are and receive restoration. Right, and saying they need a place of instruction to understand the images and archetypes so that they will receive restoration. And what are the images and the archetypes? Well, as we know, archetypes are basically the understanding of the different structures of the mind. So we have to understand the images, we have to understand basically understand what existence really is, understand ourselves, understand the uh, archetypes are patterns, understanding the patterns of existence, understanding the patterns of reality, understanding the patterns of ourselves, which is why we need to like understand the divine images and archetypes. These are, you know, it's sort of like peering. It's like seeing the, the code in the matrix, you know, peering behind the veil to see how everything operates and a places, a places of learning are necessary for this. So it has a preliminary concord with a mutual agreement which is the concord which belongs to the Father, until the totalities receive a countenance in accordance with him. This restoration is at the end. After the totality reveals what it is, the Son, who is the redemption, that is the path towards the incomprehensible Father, that is the return to the pre-existent, and after the totalities reveal themselves in that one in the proper way, who is the inconceivable one and the ineffable one and the invisible one and the incomprehensible <laughs> incomprehensible one so that it receives redemption. So um, basically what's being discussed here is the fact that Christ's function at the end of all things is to give humanity the understanding of the Father. And the Father is the ultimate ground of reality, the true essence of reality. And it's basically here this idea that, um, and, and this is one aspect that, so Valentinian Gnosticism, if you want my full view on all this, check out my other videos on Valentinian Gnosticism. There's a whole playlist on the tripartite tractate. Valentinian Gnosticism is much different from Sethian Gnosticism, where, well, I wouldn't say much different, but it starts to, in my opinion, it seems like they were trying to make Gnosticism more compatible with what would become mainstream Christianity. So there's more of an emphasis on the role of Christ in Valentinian Gnosticism. So in, in regular Gnosticism, Christ is an enlightened individual that wants to help humanity. Same thing with Valentinian Gnosticism, an enlightened individual that wants to help humanity. Of course, in Valentinian Gnosticism, uh, Christ is there from the very beginning as the Son, but so is the Church as well. We're all eternal. We're all there at the beginning. And in Sethian Gnosticism, sometimes Christ is seen as the avatar of Sophia. There are different interpretations. But in Valentinian Gnosticism, there's a little more emphasis given on Christ. Is almost seeming like Christ is required to come to this knowledge. That Christ had to be there to reveal this knowledge to humanity. Uh, which, which I'm not a really big fan of. It's not emphasizing that, you know, overly. But it definitely gives a much higher role to... Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has a big role in, in Gnosticism in general, but in 
Valentinian Gnosticism, they seem to flirt a little more with him being a savior figure. Not, not totally, it's still about knowledge and understanding, but it's like the idea of, oh, well, um, it's like through the knowledge of Christ, one is able to understand the in, in, incomprehensible father. So it says that it was not only the release from the dominion of the left. Okay, so this is interesting. So now we're going to talk about the archons here. Okay, let me see how, how long this is. So, oh my. Oh, there's a lot more here. Okay. I just, I, I love to dissect every little aspect of this because there's so much that we can understand. But let me try and go a little faster here. So if some of this stuff is like, what are you talking about? Just stick with me. We're going to go through this and, and see what it has to say. So it says, it was not only the release from the domination of the left ones, nor it was only escape from the power of those of the right, to each of which we thought that were slaves and sons, from which none escapes without quickly becoming theirs again. But the redemption also is an ascent to the degrees which are in the pleroma and to those who have named themselves and who conceive of themselves according to the power of each of the eons. And it is an entrance into what is silent, where there is no need for voice, nor for knowing, nor for forming a concept, nor for illumination, but where all things are light while they do not need to be illumined. All right. Um, did I... I feel like there, I feel like I missed a, a section. Maybe it comes later, but anyway, this is important. So what are they talking about here? Now we're talking about the archons. They're saying here that this redemption, this return, this restoration, this totality, this finality is not only a release from the domination of the left ones, nor was it only an escape from the power of those of the right to each of which were thought that were slaves and sons from whom none escapes without quickly becoming theirs again. So basically it's saying that this redemption isn't just about escaping the archons. We're talking about the left and the right. The left and the right were associated with uh, different kinds of archons that were sort of in this uh, battle. Uh, the left were associated with like the material body and then the right was associated with the mind. Not the spirit. The spirit is sort of above both the mind and the body according to this type of Gnosticism. So you have the archons that are essentially the left, the forces of the left and the right that are trapping humanity in various ways. Uh, in, in this, there's, well, all right, in various ways through the body and the mind. And, and, when one dies, according to Gnosticism, Gnostics believe in reincarnation. So you would be reinserted into a body by the archons. So this is why it's saying that this, this restoration isn't just about being released from the domination of the left and the right archons, or it's not just about escape from their power. And that's what it says from those whom none escapes without quickly becoming theirs again, referring to... Um, reincarnation, but the redemption also is an ascent to the degrees which are in the pleroma and to those who have named themselves and who conceive of themselves, blah, 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 blah. I want to go a little faster so we can get through more of this. Um, but this is a place where they're basically saying, look, this restoration isn't just about transcending the material world and escaping the archons. It is about entering the pure realm of the pleroma where you don't even need illumination anymore because there, there's no such thing as illumination. There's no such thing as knowing and there's no such thing as a concept because when all things are light, things don't need illumination. Basically, when you don't need light, if everything is lit up, you don't need to know anything if you already know everything. So you're entering the realm of all knowledge and all light and all things such that it becomes nothing. And this is the idea that the totality of all reality is a nothing. And the reason why the totality of all existence is a kind of nothing is because it's perfect, but it's not a nothing that's empty. It's a nothing that's full. Pleroma means fullness. Now, mathematically, we understand this in the Neogenian system through the concept of zero that's balanced by eternal energy. 
If you have infinite eternal energy, where all negative energy is balanced by positive energy, you get a sum total of zero. So if you think about it mathematically, if you have all negative numbers paired with all positive numbers, it equals zero. So you can have a system full of all numbers, but ultimately it, it equals zero if you think about it in its in entirety. Same thing if you have infinite energy, you can think of it as a system of ultimately zero energy that contains infinite energy. So this idea of the pleroma or the fullness is about the idea that you don't need illumination there. You don't need light there. You don't need to know anything there because it's all knowledge and all things. And when all things are perfect, it's, it's a kind of nothing because there's no difference. If there were any kind of differences, it wouldn't be perfect. You can think of perfect, you know, when you put a puzzle together, the puzzle is perfect when all the pieces are in the right place. If you have a piece that's not in the right place, well, it's not perfect anymore. It's imperfect. So you can think of the puzzle of existence when all the pieces fit together so well that there's no difference anymore. Because if something were here and another thing were there, well, that wouldn't be perfect. Something would be out of alignment. All things have to be perfectly and totally aligned and harmonized such that there isn't anything to experience anymore. So not only do humans need re redemption, but also the angels too need redemption, along with the image and the rest of the pleroma of the eons and the wondrous powers of illumination, so that we might not be in doubt in regard to the others, even the son himself, who has the position of redeemer of the totality, needed redemption as well. He who had become man, since he gave himself for each thing which we need, we in the flesh who are his church. Now when he first received redemption from the word which had descended upon him, all the rest received redemption from him, namely those who had taken him to themselves. For those who received the one who had received redemption also received what was in him. So everyone needs redemption. Even the angels need redemption. And uh, even Christ needs redemption. They say Christ needs re redemption because he became human. So they're basically saying nothing is exempt here. All things need redemption. All things need. And when we're talking about redemption, remember, it's about a knowledge of a return to unity. It's not a forgiveness of sin, but a knowledge and return to unity. The Father had foreknowledge of him since he was in his thought before anything else came into being and since he had those in whom he has revealed him. He set the deficiency on the one who remains for certain periods and times as a glory for his pleroma since the fact that he is unknown is a cause of his production from his agreement. Just as reception of knowledge of him is a manifestation of his lack of envy and revelation of the abundance of his sweetness, which is the secondary glory. So too, he has been found to be a cause of ignorance, although he is also a begetter of knowledge. Let's um, hold on. There's, there's an aspect that I want to get to that I like a lot. And let me see where it is here. Okay. Excellent. So, now let's return to this idea of the bridal chamber because this is important here. So it says, as for the bab, and I'm sorry that I had to skip a lot. Um, there were a couple of quite a lot I had to skip actually, but I'm just looking at the time and I want to make sure that we can get to this because there's some really interesting ideas here that I want to discuss with you. So it says, as for the baptism, which exists in the fullest sense into which the totalities will descend and in which they will be, there is no other baptism apart from this one alone, which is the redemption into God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when confession is made through faith in those names, which are a single name of the gospel, when they have come to believe what has been said to them, namely that they exist. And, well, hold on. From 
this, they have their salvation. Those who believe that they exist, this is attaining in an invisible way to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an undoubting faith. And when they have borne witness to them, so it also is with a firm hope that they have attained them so that the return to them might become the perfection of those who have believed in them and so that the Father might be one with them, the Father, the God, whom they confessed in faith and knowledge, who gave them their union with him in knowledge. Okay. The next part is the important part, but I wanted to preemptively discuss this because I want you to notice, like Valentinian Gnosticism, this is a lot getting a lot closer to more fundamentalist Christianity, where it's talking about this need to believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and have undoubting faith and things like that. Um, you can see that this is a lot more in line with what would become fundamentalist Christianity. How so? And that's a big step away from Sethian Gnosticism and previous forms of Gnosticism, or even forms of Gnosticism that were on, alongside Valentinian Gnosticism, that were completely different from this. But you can see that they're getting a little closer to the more fundamentalist, what would become the fundamentalist idea of you know, having to believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and all these kinds of things. But, but here, here's the important part. You can see where they're going to bring it back around to knowledge. And this is one of the reasons why I think that the Valentinian Gnostics were, you know, sort of doing this on purpose. Like, oh, let's create something that will appeal to people, but will ultimately bring them to knowledge. So, Right, it says, the Father might be one with them, the Father, the God, whom they have confessed in faith and who have gave them their union with him in knowledge. The baptism, which we previously mentioned, is called garment of those who did not strip themselves of it. For those who will put it on and those who have received redemption wear it. So when they're talking about the garment of those who do not strip themselves of it, this means lasting change. Once someone undergoes this process of transformation, it's not temporary. It's eternal. It's going to be with them forever. This is what it means by the garment of those who do not strip themselves of it. It's, it's a garment that you wear that you're not going to take off. It is also called the confirmation of the truth, which has no fall. So once again, the confirmation of the truth, which has no fall is an unshakable truth. It's a sturdy foundation. It's not going to crumble. It's not going to fall. It's about this recognition and acknowledgement of the higher unchanging true reality, the unshakable reality, the foundational existence, the confirmation of the truth, which has no fall in an unwavering and immovable way. It grasps those who have received the restoration while they grasp, grasp it. Baptism is called silence because of the quiet and the tranquility. It is also called bridal chamber because of the agreement and the indivisible state of those who have known him. So you can see that they're talking about this process in many different terms. They're talking about it in terms of baptism. They're talking about it in terms of the bridal chamber. So this is talking about that idea, this, this process of transformation, this process of understanding truth is related to the bridal chamber, which is unity, the unity of the human aspect with the divine aspect, the lower self and the higher self. And it is also called the light, which does not set and is without flame, since it does not give light, but those who have worn it are made into light. And that's really cool. I, I like this a lot, right? And I'm going to read it again because it's just, it's, it's really cool. It is also this process is also called the light which does not set and was out and is without flame. Since it does not give light, but those who have worn it are made into light. So that's kind of the idea of well, when you it's similar to the idea of oh well in the pleroma, 
there is no knowledge in light because everything is light and everything is known. Everything is illuminated and everything is known, so nothing needs to be lit up. This idea of this is a light that doesn't give off, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, produce light, it turns you into the light. It's something that doesn't fade. It's not like physical light, you know, like a flame, you can have a flame that'll eventually, you know, a flame gives out physical light and eventually flickers out and dies. This is an eternal light that doesn't, you know, that's not emanating, but rather is internal. It's an internal light that transforms one into light. I just think that's, that's such a cool image. I like that a lot. The light which does not set and is without flame since it does not give light, but those who have worn it are made into light. They are the ones whom he wore. Baptism is also called the eternal life, which is immortality. And it is called that which is entirely simply in the proper sense, what is pleasing and inseparably and irremovably and faultlessly and imperturably for the one who exists for those who have received a beginning for what else is there to name it in apart from quote unquote God, since it is the totalities. That is, even if it is given numberless names. So, uh, oh, they have simply spoken in reference to it. So, uh, this process of being transformed into light is also called the eternal life. This understanding, this knowledge, this sorry if I'm hitting this, this bridal chamber, this union of opposites, the union of the divine, the restoration. It's also about immortality, it says. It's called the eternal life, which is immortality. Why is it eternal life? What, why is it immortality? And this theme is happens quite often in Gnosticism. In one of the very first lines, I think it's the very first line in, yeah, the very first line of the Gospel of Thomas, it says, these are the secret teachings of Jesus, and anyone who understands these will never die. And so there's this theme of immortality once one attains gnosis and knowledge. And how does one attain immortality? Well, because you realize that you're not your body. You realize that you are eternal. You are immortal. In terms of your, your physical body can die and you always want to be very careful to make sure you're safe and you take care of your physical body. Your avatar is important, but you as an eternal mind are eternal. And this is discussing about how when one achieves gnosis or knowledge of this, they become eternal because they realize that they are not their bodies. They are an eternal mind. They realize what they are. Now, in terms of, of Gnosticism, this is uh, realizing that they're an emanation and a divine spark of the Pleroma of the One. That they are divine light rather than material. Now, this is very important for understanding the fact that, you know, the same is true of us. When we realize this, and I think a lot of people think it's like, uh, it's, I think it's dis disappointing to a lot of people because a lot of people almost think like, ah, that's, like that, like it's some how kind of a that's it's not really real or it's like a trick or something like that. But no, when you actually reach a new level of consciousness and realize that you are not your body, you realize that you are eternal. It's the difference between if you were wearing a VR headset, but you believed that that VR world is real. It's like realizing, oh, I'm not the character in the game. I'm so much more than the character in the game. And that is as real as can be. And so this realization, this gnosis, true realization, I don't mean like theoretical or philosophical, speculative musings. I mean, when one really reaches another level of consciousness and understands that they are an eternal divine being, then one realizes that I'm, you're immortal. I'm immortal. We're immortal. Once again, I want to always, because there are a lot of people out there who are crazy. I want to remind it, remind you, highlight it, make it crystal clear. Your body is not immortal. Your body, you as a body, you can die. So be safe. Don't hurt yourself. Take care of yourself. It's very important to take care of your body 
And uh, because we're here to learn and grow and understand, and we want to make sure we have healthy avatars to be able to do that. So, but there's this really cool idea of light that becomes light and understanding that one is immortal. And then we have the idea here that uh, it says, let's see. In the proper sense, what is pleasing and separately and irremovably and faultlessly and imperturbably for the one who exists, for those who have received a beginning. For what else is there to name it apart from God? So now we're talking about just existence, the source of reality. It's saying, and, and remember, this is completely different than the Christian idea of God which is the creator of the material world, Jehovah, Yahweh, which in Gnosticism is an archon, a much lesser being. It's not even an eon. It's, a, it's a pretty low in the hierarchy. So this God, they're basically saying it's, it's what well, we might as well call it God because it's the all that there is. It says, for what else is there to name it apart from God? And God is even in, in, in quotes here. What, what, what else can we name it apart from God? Since it is the totalities, it is the all, it is the everything. That is, even if it is given numberless names, they are spoken simply as a reference to it. So even if you call it countless names, these are all just references, different aspects of the totality just as he transcends every word and he transcends every voice and he transcends every mind and he transcends everything and he transcends every silence so it is detography with those who are that which he is this is that which they find it to be ineffably and inconceivably in its visage for the coming into being in those who know through whom they have comprehended, who is the one whom they gave glory. So it's this transcendence and return to the totality, to the all, to everything, to that realm that is perfect and beyond, beyond words. So according to Valentinian Gnosticism, this is the total dissolution of all things. It's every, everything requires redemption. Uh, it says even the angels, the angels require redemption. The archons require redemption. Even Christ requires redemption. They said, well, why does Christ require redemption? Well, because he became human. It's this idea that, and remember, redemption here is, we, we have to understand what Gnostics are talking about. The redemption or restoration is a return to the unity. So, of course, Christ would require redemption because Christ, in Christ's pure form, is just an aspect of the unity. To become human, well, separation occurs. All, all of this, you know, you need to have a body. You need to be in the material world. That is so far removed from the perfect realm of pure unity that, of course, a redemption needs to... It's like a reintegration. It's like... You know, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you built up a, a, a Lego structure when you want to put the Legos away again, you have to break the structure back down. That's kind of like, that, that's kind of an interesting way to, to put it. If you imagine reality as being like a box of Legos, yeah, that's a good way to imagine a bucket of Legos. If we're thinking about reality in terms of a bucket of Legos... The one, God, the totality, the source, is the bucket and the Legos. The bucket and the... This is actually real. Now I think about it. This is, pretty good. this is a pretty good analogy. God is the bucket. God is the bucket of the Legos. God is the bucket and God is the Legos. The emanation of all reality is sort of like dumping the Legos out. You dump all the Legos out and the Legos are still God but now they're in a different mode. They're spread out. These are the emanations of the one. And then these Legos, 
can begin to arrange themselves in different structures. Let's say one Lego, you know, one Lego structure arranges itself one way, another Lego structure arranges it another way, and they have their own functions. And some of these structures begin building other structures. And these are like the eons that create the different eonic realms and different uh, structures of the psyche and the mind. And then eventually you have Lego structures like Archon Lego structures that build a whole Lego material world and then start, you know, animating the little Lego humans in the Lego world. But ultimately everything is still God. It's all Legos. So it's all God and it all came from the bucket and it is all things. So this is the idea of like, well, you can't really give it a name. You can't say it's this or that or that. It's just everything there is. It's all that there is and everything it is. So the return or the end of the world or the end of the universe or the end of all things is essentially this idea of breaking all the Legos down and putting them back in the bucket. And so once one breaks all the Legos down and puts them back in the bucket, it's a return to unity again. It's a return to the source. It's a return to perfection. Now, there's one thing that I want to say. Now, we're talking about Gnosticism. So one thing that I want to say real quick, according to Gnostics, the material world is evil. It's a prison. It's like a torture chamber. And the, po the whole point of Gnosticism is to escape the material world and to return to the source. So the Neogenian system, it do doesn't agree with that. The Neogenian system, there are a lot of similar similarities, like the material world being a kind of illusion and the fact that we are all higher beings just having a material experience. But we don't look at the material world as being n intrinsically bad. We see it as being a manifestation of our collective will and we can make it into anything we want. So the world is a really shitty place because it's ruled by shitty wills that make it into a shitty place. But if we don't, we can try. It's like the, you know, you can build a, a, a really bad Lego structure. Or you can build a really great Le Lego structure, but depends on who, who builds it right now. We have a lot of crappy architects. And so we have a crappy world, but we can build the kingdom of heaven on earth. As Christ says in the gospel of Thomas, when he says the kingdom of heaven is within you and all around you, it's not somewhere you go to when you die. It's not up in the sky. It's within you and all around you. So the Neogenian has has uh, a much more idea that aligns much more with that Gospel of Thomas view, that it's within you and all around you. And so we want to be able to acknowledge our unity, but transform the world as well and transformed our, transform ourselves as well. And when it comes to reaching that point at the end of the universe and the end of time and all reality, we're all going towards that point. And we're all heading towards there. But our our goal isn't necessarily to, to rush towards it. It's to en enjoy our creative powers and our transformations and our experiences and the journey while we get there. Because the point itself is boring. It's it's breaking down all the Legos and putting them in the bucket. It's over. It's done. You you can you can also think of it, think of it like the end of a video game, beating a video game or finishing a book. The whole fun is reading the story. And the whole fun of the game is playing the game. If you didn't read it in the book and you just read the very last page, that would not be a very satisfying book. If you just didn't play the video game and immediately watch the end credits, that would be a pretty boring game. So the point here isn't this kind of like mad rush we're getting there is the intrinsic goal. It is the goal that we will ultimately reach and ultimately be pulled towards because the more connected we are, the closer we get to that point because total and pure connection is pure nothingness because we're totally connected. There is no difference. So it is a point that we will reach and it's not a negative point. It's not a bad point. Fit beating a game is extremely satisfying. Finishing a book is extremely satisfying. So, it is, in, in that sense, something that we are working towards. But we want to shift the perspective instead of thinking like, oh, Earth is hell and, and, and we got to get there. It's more like we're in the middle of a story and we need to make the story better. 
it's a really crappy story right now. It's a story with death and destruction and hatred and homophobia and sexism. We can totally change it. We can write a better story. We can program a better game. We're the programmers, we're the authors, we're the architects. We can create whatever we so will. And so our goal here is to transform the world, transform humanity and transform consciousness so we can build that kingdom of heaven right here and right now, that unconquerable citadel on the hill that is our citadel of light and knowledge and understanding of what we really are, what we truly are. And we can work towards building that unity together right here and right now. So the Neogenian system isn't about ends, it's about beginnings. That's why it's about a new beginning. So we're here to create a new beginning, a new transformation, a new earth. And now every end is a beginning, but we don't want to be so focused on the idea of, of, um, so it, it's kind of like that idea of, of the Christian fundamentalist interpretation of the end of the world, rather than thinking of it as, well, the end of the old world. The end of the world will come, absolutely, but it will be the end of the old world so that we can birth a new world, an enlightened world, a beautiful world, as long as humanity doesn't destroy itself first. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to build and transform the world, to usher in a new beginning, a new consciousness, a new earth. We are the architects. We are the authors. And that's why Neogenian means new beginning, because we are the new beginning. So I hope you enjoyed this, my friends. Like I said, there's a lot of videos on the Tripartite Tractate. Check out my whole playlist. There's a lot of videos on my channel. Please like and subscribe so that we can spread this information, get people to learn about this stuff. It's important. That's how we transform the world, transform consciousness by spreading information, spreading knowledge. That's what Gnosticism was all about. And we continue to spread knowledge through the different contents that uh, Neogenians create and information that we spread. So like, subscribe, it helps out a lot. And also, if you want to help my channel grow, if you want to help me create bigger and better videos, support over on Patreon. It's the best way to support my work and you get access to all of our members only videos there's a new members only video every single week and you can also get access to that as well by supporting here on youtube at tier two or higher and as always remember this is not church so don't feel obligated to support monetarily you don't have to there are plenty of free ways you can support like liking and subscribing but i do appreciate it very much i want to shout out those who do uh, especially renaissance fairy cassidy angela the halloween mom db and key Selena, paul rogers eric fire Massam, christopher smith and everyone else Thank you very much.